Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on November 29th. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The model list is in the video description. Now the first thing I needed to deal with in this live stream was the Pluto probe I launched in the previous episode. So uh, here I am. Initially I had used MechJeb to plot a uh, course to Pluto. Unfortunately, that would require a very long burn after a month of this probe being in orbit. The problem with that is fuel boil off, we would lose so much fuel that we wouldn't be able to make the burn. So here I am plotting a two-stage thing, where we do part of the burn initially, and then do a mid-course correction after a little bit. Uh, now, the fuel boil off situation is still a problem there, but it sort of shoves it off to a different stage, and our later stages are hypergolic, they don't have any fuel boil off. It's really only liquid hydrogen that we need to worry about. Um, the problem is that it is still a little bit tight. If you look at the delta V situation there, uh, we're still retaining half of a hydrogen stage in order to do the mid-course plane change, and so we probably, I mean, it's tough to say whether we'd have enough. Now, here I'm trying to do another plot and try to figure out something else, but I accidentally hit upon uh, Uranus transfer. Uh, weirdly, Uranus is named Elu right now. Uh, I, I've already fixed that, don't worry. Uh, but, uh, yep. So, I double check whether that was just a fluke or whether it's a good time to transfer to Uranus. And since it seems like it is a good time to transfer to Uranus, uh, given that I will accept the fact that it's going to take more than two decades to get there, I will launch a separate probe the same kind of probe, it's a Pluto probe, but I'll launch it to Uranus instead. So, but I still want to hit to Pluto here, and you can see me getting a plot there. Unfortunately, this requires more than 13,000 meters per second of burn, uh, pretty much immediately. Uh, you can only, uh, if you want to do one burn and then go around, you can do 3,000 first and then go around, but you can't do much more than that. So it's basically just got to be one huge long burn. Anyway, here I am taking a look at the SLS Block 3 with a Pluto probe, and so this will launch the Uranus probe, actually. It, I haven't, I'm not going to change the probe at all. Now, the SLS Block 3 is just the SLS core with four M1 boosters. I wanted it to have a payload capacity of SLS Block 2. It turns out that after this mission, I find out that it actually has a payload capacity more like SLS Block B, uh, 1B. So, a little bit of a fail there. Anyway, here we go. Okay, off it goes. Four M1 boosters and four RS-25 engines. Space Shuttle main engines there. The boosters are arrayed so that they share the hard points that would normally go for the larger boosters. These boosters are much lighter than the big SRBs that are on SLS normally. Um, and they sort of share the point where those SRBs attach. So they're on somewhat asymmetrically. But that's alright. And that's similar to the way they're mounted on the shuttle, which we will see later in the episode. They're not quite the same. You can sort of see the arrangement there as they separate. Okay, they are off, and it's a long burn ahead of us because this is a suboptimal situation right now. I didn't realize it was suboptimal until, well, right about now, as I'm having to maintain a lot of extra pitch. And you can see the deviation between my pitch and the prograde vector, which indicates that this is not the best situation. Now, the reason this needs to tilt up is not for this stage's sake, but for the next stage, the second stage, which in this case is a J2X. Normally for SLS Block 1B, it would be a set of four RL-10Cs, but here we have separation. And for this special Block 3 variant, I've got a J2X, as I do for my hypothetical SLS Block 1C. And the reason I do that is because I want more thrust, because if I tried to use RL-10Cs, this stage would be very, 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 very long. And that's just not conducive to live streaming. Uh, you can have it, it will work, it'll uh, have the payload end up in orbit and all, 
but uh, it'll have to pitch up also. And uh, here I have to use a lot more of this stage than I intended. This was supposed to be the payload stage. But again, because this turned out to be underpowered, I had to use about, uh, I think it ended up being 400 meters per second or so. Okay, so here we are getting to orbit. And this stage is 5 RL60s, which is a variant on the RL10. Very close variant, so a similar stats. Okay, so there we have our planned encounter with Uranus. But uh, it's, it's just the plot, we actually have to do the burn, which is the tricky part. It is still a little bit touchy, but nothing close to as touchy as the huge transfer we had to try to make to Pluto. So this should be easier, and hopefully we'll get better results. There we have the RL-60s relighting. They have a total of 45 possible ignitions. The RL-10 has 10. We're only going to use them just this one more time. So as far as ignitions are concerned, we certainly didn't need uh, so many, but it's nice to have them. For instance, for landing purposes and stuff like that for Mars missions, perhaps. Okay, here we have a single RL-10 igniting, and that'll be our next stage. And this stage will complete our transfer to Uranus, but we will still need it for further adjustment burns, because of course this burn was not perfectly accurate. Um, just the simple fact that the transfer is not instantaneous at the maneuver node, means that it's going to be a little bit off one way or another. Though you can get it closer than I usually do. Okay, here we have the difference and I'm trying to get it there. Looks like it'll cost about 300 meters per second. There we go. Mostly it is a inclination adjustment though we have some radial and prograde component to it as well. Okay, and so turning and firing. Of course it's best to use this stage up as close to Earth as possible, its fuel is going to boil off otherwise. So that 1200 meters per second is not something we can carry with us to Uranus. Here I'm plotting a mid-course adjustment and this mid-course adjustment will occur in 13 years. Uh, so that's 160 meters per second or so. Actually probably the Hydrolox stage We'll have about 160 meters per second. Well, no, it's probably all gonna boil off in 13 years. What am I, who am I kidding? Uh, but then I test whether I could get into orbit, and it looks like it's gonna take, well, at least 855. Probably I will use more than that to get into a tight orbit, but it's definitely doable since we have 6,000 meters per second. So I queue up the mid course adjustment and then jump to the, the Pluto probe, and I uh, add the new maneuver for that into the alarm clock because we had the wrong maneuver there. Okay, this is the Venus probe now, and I have not yet noticed that I have no connection. Uh, how I didn't have, how I lost connection, I'm not entirely sure. We will see in a sec, but I'm blissfully unaware and I'm trying to check my pass at Venus, which is very close. Actually, we need to move away from Venus a little bit. And then I also see how much it's going to take to get into manual orbit around Venus instead of burn, uh, instead of air braking. And actually it's not that much, we have plenty of fuel for that, unfortunately we don't have connection. Uh, for some reason that Comtech antenna is not activated. And that's despite the fact that I clearly have electric charge. And if I was worried about electric charge, I'd lock the batteries to prevent it from drawing them and then unlock them. That would deactivate the antenna temporarily but after unlocking the batteries, I would get the antenna back. Well, I contemplate doing some some cheaty thing, but I decide not to eventually. And so I just uh, have the probe meet its demise. As so many other probes have done, so many probes have in real life lost communication and such things like that, so I guess it's not too big a stain on our record to have this one uh, fail. And here we are, approaching Venus. No clouds around Venus again. So, uh, yeah, no clouds anywhere, in fact, in this particular install. And uh, here we are, we're starting to hit the atmosphere here, and you can see the tank is heating up. Uh, it doesn't take very long in the atmosphere of Venus. We're going pretty fast, and that's why I was trying to plot to uh, get into orbit without aerobraking. 
because you can see that's going yellow now, which is very dangerous, and it's sort of a shame really, there is a portion of this, remember there's a lander portion there that could have survived this if it had been decoupled and oriented properly beforehand. Um, it has a heat shield and everything, but not in the midst of all this other stuff blowing up, it's not going to survive. Anyway, it was supposed to uh, deorbit after get after the rest of it uh, got into orbit, so it wouldn't be going this fast. Okay, typical Kerbal lag when things are exploding all over the place. So I decided not to speed up this explosion. This is how it was in real time, and that's mainly because this is our first uh, failure, our first major failure, I should say. The first failure of an interplanetary probe, and this is solar system colonization, so most of our efforts is on the interplanetary side. So I decide to linger on this particular failure, just a little. And some solemn music for that. Anyway, I turn back to my Pluto probe and try to figure out how to get it on its way. It's a really long burn and there's just no way I can do it accurately. And I seem to have lost the intended encounter. Now I can only get the little, uh, you know, closest approach markers, which is at least something, but doesn't bode well for this. So reignition of the RL-60s. This was launched on SLS-1C. Again, hypothetical. J uh, 1C just means that I replaced the RL-10s with a J2X. I do activate the antenna, make sure of that. You see, electricity generation is good. That's because we've got RTGs on this, not solar panels, so no problems there. Those will uh, keep up throughout this thing's flight. So, yeah, uh, it's an active satellite, so that's the positive side of all this. As we settle the fuel down, separate the RL-60 stage, and start the RL-10. Now, we've got a long way to go yet. This stage will completely burn out, and then we have to go on to the next stage in order to continue. The next stage being in Estes. Here we are. We are really departing Earth now. The problem again is because we can only do 3,000 before we get to escape velocity, so it has to be one long burn. Either you could do 3,000 and do another 9,000 meter per second burn, actually 10,000 meter per second burn, or you just do all 13,000 like I did here. And uh, yeah, accuracy was pretty much out the window at this point, as we are well over the Indian Ocean and selling fuel down for the Estes engine. Next, this is hypergolic now, no risk of boil off. But uh, for optimization purposes, I had to keep this one fairly small. You see, it's only producing about 1,600 meters per second, adding that to the mix. So we'll actually get to the final stage here. And uh, here, the Estes is running out, and we'll get to the probe itself. The probe itself has a lunar module ascent engine as its core engine. Most probes just have RCS, but uh, for time's sake, I mean, most probes can take however long they like to accelerate. This one, I wanted to get, well, it was already quite a long burn to get it on its way. I'm definitely going to have to work out how to do a Jupiter slingshot next time. There's no way I'm going to launch a Pluto probe like this again. We're going to have to figure out how to take advantage of Jupiter from now on. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, the The plotted transfer is done. We have about, well, close to a thousand meters per second left, but you can see uh, didn't quite get us there. And as I boosted up using RCS, you can see it's not got the ascending node right where I had it before. The ascending node used to be uh, to the, let's say, left-hand side. Right now, the ascending node is right on, right in the middle of the the projected orbit there. And that means that Pluto will be still behind when we touch its orbit. We don't want that. We want it to be... So I, I try and fix it, but you can see how far behind it is. And so uh, that all I can do is uh, create a radial burn to try and move myself so that the ascending node is on one side. And you can see I'm trying to move that ascending node to the left, um, to the later portion of the orbit, 
and right now I'm quite aware that I don't have enough delta V to do this particular maneuver. So I need some alternative maneuver and so what I do is I set up a maneuver which will pull my orbit down so I go quickly once and then go out. So I basically waste time so that Pluto can catch up on the first orbit and then hit Pluto on the second orbit. And that's what you see there. Unfortunately the sum of those two maneuvers is about 1,100 meters per second, 1,140 or so, and that's more than I have. So this leaves my Pluto probe, well, basically unable to do its job. It can't get to Pluto. Well, I don't know what to say about that. I, I leave it be for now, and I ponder the issue, and I turn to something completely different, which is my shuttle. This is the 4 booster variant of the shuttle, so its maximum cargo capacity is 50 tons. And actually I've got the test payload in there, but at the bidding of people in chat I asked what sort of payload I should launch on it. And uh, we came to the conclusion that a docking adapter for the station, because the Sky Nest right now only has two docking ports, and one is occupied by a Dragon capsule and the other by a Dragon version 2. So we definitely need more do docking ports. I also have a module tug there, which is basically a bundle of RCS ports and RCS fuel. And it's also got uh, RCS ports on booms that extend for maneuverability. So here the shuttle is on the launch pad. The boosters are M1 boosters. And you see here, I'm going to try out a uh, shuttle script I had used before. And so this is a KOS launch script. And it is specifically for shuttles and we'll see how it works but this this model of the shell isn't really configured for KOS um, I'll get to that in a moment but we've got all engines running there are four RS-25s on the external tank two on the shuttle itself and then the four M1s so KOS has control over this there is a configuration for this shuttle that has the boosters recoverable and also the engine cluster on the external tank recoverable but this is not that variant because I wanted to reduce part count to maximize uh, frame rates and such so uh, this has all those extra parts taken off and also smart parts that are meant to separate the boosters automatically when they run out of fuel so that it can work with KOS so those are not there now we are going pretty well so far but there seems to be a little bit of a jitteriness to it with KOS. You can see it's rolling back and forth. So I decide to abort the program. Uh, you'll see me do that in a sec here. There we go. Program aborted. And now I'm in control myself because I didn't trust KOS to do it because it was rolling so much. So, so much for KOS for now. But here's booster separation. So those are the M1 boosters off. And now you can more clearly see the engine cluster on the bottom of the external tank. On we go. And of course, the fact that this has uh, six RS-25s is key to its huge payload capacity. Double what the STS shuttle had. And of course, as usual, I lock the uh, top oxygen tank to help with balance. See the engine gimbling there. Now this video is uh, sped up 4x. And as you can probably tell by the timer, it can't quite keep up with real time. Actually, I think it's um, eight times slower than real time. So in other words, uh, eight seconds real time for one second in game. Uh, it's about that ratio. So the entire launch took about 40, 50 minutes or so. Okay, here we're coming to the end of it, trying to get a nice orbit with the remainder of the external tank. Okay, external tank off, and it'll, uh, it'll of course re-enter, and that's why it's got the 66 kilometer periapsis. Good re-entry altitude for it. And now the shuttle uses... I accidentally I activated the rapier engines. It's supposed to use the RL-10s. It's got next to the RS-25s for, uh, for this particular burn, the circularization burn getting into full orbit. But I ended up activating the rapiers, which are actually supposed to be used... Uh, during descent to help land the shuttle. They burn methane and oxygen uh, and the bright side of them is that they have uh, unlimited ignitions uh, and they throttle. Uh, I have uh, counteracted that by giving them a subpar ISP. Their top vacuum ISP is only 317 and on top of that their thrust is nowhere near where it should be for an engine of their mass 
So I activated the fuel cells and now I'm aiming for a rendezvous. Mm, there we go. Still a pretty wide separation but it's a good start. And so I allow the rapiers to ignite again. Now I could use their R10s, they have better efficiency. Um, it's probably better to burn some of the rapier fuel off because those engines are not as efficient and it'll give the RL-10s more efficiency. The RL-10s have 10 ignitions, which is more than enough. Here we are doing a second burn actually over, well, the Philippines right there. And here to match speeds with the station, I do activate the RL-10s. Now, unfortunately, I didn't remember what the action group to activate the RL-10s was and I had already messed up the staging, so I had to activate them manually as you saw there. This is a pretty expensive shuttle with all these engines. Anyway, so here we're killing the remainder of the velocity with the station. I was having a lot of trouble uh, controlling the shuttle for some reason. I'm not too sure why still. I thought I had the RCS balanced and pretty powerful RCS ports as well as gimbling on the RL-10s, but it seemed to be very difficult to control it. And I'll have to look into that because it was really not acceptable and probably would be dangerous to re-enter it in its current state. I got the relative velocity to the station up so that I could uh, park the shuttle as closely as possible. I decided that going for 0.1 meters per second would be good enough. It is not docking with the station yet. First of all, there's no free docking port. And second of all, that wasn't really part of the plan. Though I might eventually want to transfer the crew to the station instead of having it in the shuttle so I could test the orbit the shuttle and see how bad it really is. But anyway, on that note, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this summary of the missions that were conducted on live stream on November 29th. And if you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.